please welcome Amelia Winger Berksin. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Nyaweskano. Uh, that means thank you, and I'm glad you're well in my language. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Amelia Winger Bearskin, and I'm a member of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan. Um, and some people might have heard of us as the Haudenosaunee. Seneca Cayuga are a member of the Six Nations Haudenosaunee. Some people call us Iroquois. It's not what we call ourselves ourselves the Haudenosaunee Confederacy of Nations, so you might have heard us Oneida, Onondaga, uh, Tuscarora, Mohawk, and then of course Seneca Cayuga. So I'm a member of Seneca Cayuga, but um, my tribe moved to Oklahoma during the Trail of Tears. So that's why I say of Oklahoma, because that's where my reservation is. All right, excellent. So I'm, and my title outside of my nation, my tribal nation, is I'm a Banks Endowed Chair of Artificial Intelligence and the Arts at the Digital Worlds Institute at the University of Florida. I'm the founder and director of the AI Climate Justice Lab, the Talk To Me About Water Collective, and Wampum Codes, a value-based dependency and framework, um, as well as a podcast where I interview other members of the global indigenous about the positive ways they're using technology to make change in their communities. Um, so throughout my artistic career, I have found ways to engage with different aspects of emerging technologies. One of the most significant technologies to emerge in the past decade or so has been the array of models and tools that are grouped under the name AI, or artificial intelligence, right? So in this talk, I'd like to explain how I've approached some of these ideas and issues of artificial intelligence as an artist and as an indigenous person. But first, I want to take a step back and take a meta look at the ways our culture figures and receives, receives AI. And is everyone hearing okay? My mic, I'm hearing a, it sounds not, yeah, it doesn't sound good. I'm kind of hearing a weird, it, it, maybe I could do a handheld if that is okay. I, I can't, but I believe someone can. Um, or do you want to do, move to the, yeah, I kind of cut, I'm hearing it cut in and out too, so let's maybe just, all right. Thank you so much. I'm going to pull it off my head if that's okay. <laughs> I don't know if that one's on either. Can you hear it now? <clears throat> yes, better. Uh, yeah, it was kind of going in and out. I was hearing like a, ooh, all right. I don't want to hurt anyone's ears or hearts or feelings. So, um, so you know, I'm going to be talking a little bit about artificial intelligence today because that's what I research. Um, and I come at it from an a a AI researcher standpoint, data science standpoint, um, but also as an artist and indigenous person. So um, I'm going to take a little step back and think about ways in which my culture and our cultures, all of us, are receiving AI and what kind of stories we're telling about it. So this is all a part of discovering the stakes of AI. What is at stake? And also coming to understand the ways in which art and storytelling can intervene and with these massively powerful technologies, what stories we're building. So I teach a class at the University of Florida called AI plus Art Science Fiction. And in this class, we look at major advancements in the field of AI, starting with very early computers like the Abacus. Right? It's Turing complete, it's a computer. Wampum from my own tribe, and the Andean practice of Kipu, or the advanced Nebatean uh, water architecture that was practiced during um, times in, in the land which is now known as Jordan. So those were some of our first computational devices. And we also look at, in this class, how we use artificial intelligence in our daily lives, for our arts, for our storytelling, and in science. On the first day of class, I ask my students to think of a powerful fictional narrative that they know that uses AI. It's, maybe it's their first encounter with science fiction, or a video game, or a movie, or a book, or an article, anything, whatever you want. Then, after we've populated a screen filled with all of their answers, we look at it together in aggregate. And I say, in which of these stories is AI, artificial intelligence, right? Which one of these stories is AI the good guy? Or AI is framed as a helper? Or something that's positive? And only once did we find an example after teaching this class for two years uh, where a student suggested it. And she said, in this book, which I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the book, but she said, in this book, first the AI was evil. And then the people had to teach it empathy and then it was able to help people. So even in the one example where it was positive, it still didn't start that way. 
So <clears throat> I asked them, if we can't even imagine a world where AI solved a problem rather than creating one, then what is the, our creation story of AI? Why do we invest so much time, so much energy, and so much research dollars, and I would also say you know, a big carbon footprint as well, into it if we cannot imagine a way in which a possible future might emerge where it can help us, where it becomes something that we use to make the world a better place? Why did we even think to create it in the first place then, right? What, what's it for? So you know, in our innovation centers, of course, here at Yale, many esteemed innovators that are here in this great city, we hear a lot of pitches about AI. That can, it can solve problems, cure or diagnose illness. It can understand water data or ice caps. We look at ways in which we could help people to learn how to be more efficient or to be a co-creation tool for creatives. Like this image you see behind you is actually a film of Governor's Island where I've used an AI algorithm in painting, a lot of you familiar with that in the back there, um, to erase the New York skyline. So you're kind of, I, I did the interpolation poorly, so you can kind of see it on a delay. It's slowly uh, making invisible the built environment of Governor's Island. So when we pull all of this out into the world of storytelling, we can see there's still a profound ambivalence surrounding the entire enterprise, right? It seems as though we still have a lot of anxiety type of anxiety that is more about how the world is unequal now and how we imagine this tool, AI would not be on our side, but we imagine that it would be on the side of a world that continues at a breakneck pace to become more unequal, but this time with data, right? So the storytelling we have around AI is currently one of several forms which I've kind of outlined here. So there's a sort of Frankenstein narrative, right? It's also like a Faustian story or maybe an Icarus story where uh, irreverent curiosity or the hubris of man that causes us to pursue our own greed of knowledge beyond our human abilities. That's kind of one version I see from what my students share with me. Then there's a common oracle framing, one where AI is figured as a gateway to an unspecified divinity. We enter our little prompts, it queries some cosmic database beyond our mortal understanding, and then we just sort of read the chicken bones or whatever, I don't know. But like, this is very popular, I hear, in a lot of media. Yeah, I think we all kind of saw the, some headlines recently where uh, someone made a legal case and ChatGPT cited some things that didn't exist, and they said, well, I thought it was a search engine. Well, yeah, it's kind of a good question. Like, why wouldn't they think it was a search engine? They didn't think it would make up stuff. Well, why would they, right? So it's, you know, like we, we got kind of this oracle concept, right? So there's this famous Kurzweil singularity line which in my opinion is kind of like an Armageddon type trope. And I find this one pretty snooze fest personally, but it's prevalent in the industry. So, you know, gotta mention it. Um, and we hear a lot of talk of AI in a totalitarian post-truth context that borrows heavily from stories like 1984, uh, Minority Report, The Matrix, Psychopaths, Terminator, maybe even Kafka's The Trial, right? where the machines impose a total yet impersonal domination on humankind. Then there's what I kind of title the Stockholm Syndrome version. It's like the totalitarian fantasy where I want to be the machine. Maybe I have it like implanted in my brain. This is the post-humanist ego talking. It's like a biohacky, always optimizing, self-maxing. You know, and as dangerous as it may prove to be, this framing, in my opinion, is kind of like silly and juvenile, but, you know, it seems to have a lot of purchase on occupied Ohlone territory, you know, aka Silicon Valley, so it's there. It's part of our narrative, right? So all of these stories are compelling in their way, at least to certain communities, and they've gained purchase on all of our collective imaginations in a way that have real material consequences for the future of AI research, development, policy, and public adoption. As I mentioned to my students, how many of our innovations start with imagination and start with storytelling and start with fiction even, right? So, but none of these I consider to be creation stories. Um, and so what do I mean by this? So creation stories are important to every culture, all cultures, because they embed values. They have scientific know-how, tools for future generations. Creation stories are special kinds of stories because they do not simply provide in account for like why the world is the way that it is, but they also orient us towards possible futures that exist in accordance with our values as our society. And they produce a foundation upon which we can build a shared civilization. So for instance, in the King James Bible, we have the famous lines, in the beginning was the word, 
and the word was with God, and the word was God. So you have these three clauses, and we're already set up for an entirely logocentric cosmology that will inform the entire course of Western civilization. And the Western mode of understanding the world, writing, recording, delineating, are all contained in this first sentence, like an oak in an acorn. It's kind of incredible, right? But the creation story of my people begins in a place called Skyworld. Like our satellites and oceanic tubes of the internet, it's a place to commune with those who are far away. In Skyworld, there's a woman, Skywoman, who falls towards our ocean and was saved by the creatures who lived below, a muskrat, a beaver, a turtle, many others who were, sh who were sure that she would have a soft landing on the back of a turtle shell. So you may have heard this land called Turtle Island, right? And that's why from that creation story, Turtle Island, right? So she brings with her on this journey sacred herbs and plants to make the world grow. She gives birth to twins, one who makes beauty and one who makes evil, one who creates the rose and the other the thorn. One creates clean rivers and the other one pollutes them. So there are many creation stories. You know, there's just as many creation stories as there are people. There's, there's many, many different ones of them. But if you study them and you listen to storytellers who recount them, you start to notice maybe like the family resemblances between them, reoccurring motifs that connect them across different times and places. In, in, my, in my culture's creation story, you can hear echoes of the so-called earth diver trope, in which a divine creature, an animal, or a human descends upon the earth from another realm. This narrative pattern occurs in creation stories from as far as feel as Japan, Finland, West Africa, Eurasian steppe, and of course, North America. And we also have in our story the trope of the divine twins, which reoccurs in several places in Western mythology as well, like Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, and, and also places like Romulus and Remus, the story concerning the founding of Rome. So a lot of, a lot of people have these, these, these two twins, right? And these similarities excite the imagination and curiosity, but the parallels that really demand our attention, in my opinion, are the structural similarities and the types of loads that they bear for the societies that tell them. The Haudenosaunee story is the one I know best, and it illustrates this principle very well. It contains wisdom about planting seasons, herbs, architecture, and our values connected to animals and nature. When we were all once six warring nations, this creation story is in our DNA, and it helped us to lay down our weapons and form a confederacy based on our great law of peace, coated with wampum shells. And this law is sometimes referred to as the Gayanash Goa, or the law we call a constitution. And it's divided into 117 articles. And the United Haudenosaunee nations are symbolized by an eastern white pine tree called the Tree of Peace. Each nation or tribe plays a delineated role in the conduct of government. We believe that the events of this formation date back to about the 12th century, like 1190. So this story survived a long time, right? It survived the forced removal from my ancestral, ancestral lands in the northeast woodland area. Upstate New York is where I spent most of my time growing up with other Haudenosaunee in the basin of many tribal reservations. My tribe was moved, as I mentioned before, as part of the Trail of Tears to Oklahoma, and that's where our close family members live today. The first time that I heard this creation story told from someone other than my mother, who is also a storyteller for our nation, and the first time I heard the whole, like, full, real big deal, entire experience, was at the Strawberry Festival when I was eight years old. And I didn't hear the whole story in one sitting or even two. It's a very, very long story. And one that requires us to slow down and to celebrate the summer season, which, you know, we're entering now. Strawberry Festival is a time when we gather and we play games. And we listen day after day to the way our world was made. So for me, when I revisit this story, I believe that there are a few lessons from it. Um, that need to be a part of my own practice in AI, in artificial intelligence, as an educator and as an artist. So, the first one is like, where does our knowledge come from? A lot of my students imagine that interfacing with AI is like interfacing with all of the intelligence of the world. Not entirely true. It's a little biased, right? But that's kind of what they think about. So, it, where does this knowledge come from? So, like Sky Woman, we came from the connected tissue of the internet which played a large role in the formation of the insight and information many of our machine learning models are now trained from. These were created and gathered without the consent of the communities who created these assets, or these words, or the images, and songs. 
So that has to be acknowledged, right? So where did we come from? While much of the AI funding is still heavily in the world's superpowers, and AI is incredibly energy intensive, AI must be used as a tool to build an equitable world for peace and not to reinforce ancient colonial borders and to continue the process of colonization. Colonization is a tool that created our current water crisis and our climate change. So to support the survival of our planet, we need AI to be on the side of a decolonized worldview. We also haven't seen a computer yet that isn't extractive, right? That isn't, a lot of us have, have heard that maybe lithium will be gone in our lifetime, like we'll have mined all of it, that that runs so many of our devices. Um, so we haven't yet seen a fully sustainable computer, but that doesn't mean we can't invent it. Right? We used to have computers that were vacuum tubes. We used to have computers that were knitted wires together. We used to have many different computational devices like an abacus, right? So we have many ways that we can do computational processes. They do not have to be as energy intensive as they are, that they currently are. So what plants and seeds are we giving this AI? So right now we're feeding these models images, text, connections, commerce, you know, financial data on the internet. Um, the writing corpora of books that have been scanned, which is not all of them, by the way. It's heavily Western corpora. Um, and there's still many things that make us human, though, that can't be digitized. So our embodied intelligence, our bodily limitations, and our values around truth and trustworthiness that are not yet adequately represented in the features that can be extracted from us via observation by AI. So we have a lot of ways of digitizing our daily lives. But we're still missing what Frank Jackson famously he had this thought experiment. I don't know if you've heard about this. It's called What Mary Doesn't Know. He wrote a book about it also called There's Something About Mary, which is not the same as the film. The film's a little funnier. I don't know, same name though. Um, so for those unfamiliar with this thought experiment, Jackson, this is not real. I'm going to tell you a scenario. It's not real. It's a thought experiment. Jackson imagines a scientist named Mary. She's raised in a lab. Mary knows everything there is to know about human sight how to measure it, how to understand light, how our biology responds. She understands every sensor, every computational way of understanding sight. But there's one difference in Mary's world than ours. In her lab, there is no color. She lives in a black and white lab and sees everything via the internet or cameras as black and white. Okay, so when she leaves the lab, and this is the thought experiment, what is it that she learns? When she sees the color red, what is the thing that she knows now that she didn't know before? Jackson calls this missing knowledge the qualia. It's the actual experience, in this case, of seeing red. What's that experience in your body, right? So our modern AI systems are sophisticated statistical and computational models that we try to develop in order to approximate qualia. But they don't have it. They're trying to approximate, right? And we're looking to define this experience and it is vital that we can communicate what it is to be a person and our ways of knowing so that they are defendable. So we make sure the AI tools are helping to make our world better, right? And if we get this wrong, we risk not simply machines that are unable to match the epistemology of humans, we already have that, but actually we risk a world in which we adopt a warped, lossy machine epistemology that flattens us into black and white and encourages us to devalue the qualia of our own sentience. Okay, so what about the twins? <laughs> one makes the world better, one makes it worse. There's, of course, a lot of duality built in this conversation as we discuss AI, which you can hear even in this tension between the two. AI has the ability to read millions of data points that are created by billions of people daily, right? Humans don't have this ability. Um, an individual could spend their entire life trying to interpret this vastness of data, and you know, we'd, we'd die before we were able to, to even do a, a, a tiny amount that, that the machine and computer can do. But because of this disparity between human and machine computational power, it becomes difficult for us to understand the black box decisions that occur in algorithms. Often experts in adjacent fields don't feel that they have time to weigh in on these processes before these new tools are rolled out. So for an example, in my talk, I often have people that ask me, and my students too, like, what does the AI think about this? Or like, what does the AI think about that? As if there's only one AI, right? Which is as if we jumped past this phase of experimentation or regulation or, you know, 
all of these steps of, of consensus, and we just arrived at a sentience where there's one true AI, and it speaks, and we can only listen. But you know, other times people say they enjoy co-creating with AI art generators because it's like collaborating with all artists in the world, except that it's not. As someone who's done the work of collaborating painfully with many artists, I have amazing collaborators in the back, though. They're n never a pain to work. They're amazing. All, all my, you know. <laughs> but sometimes it's painful, right? So, you know, the joy of collaboration is not for me typing words and then stealing bits of art and, you know, making a new AI collage, even if it has, you know, maybe five fingers on each hand. But when you ask an AI generator to paint you a night sky, you'll likely see something found in the Western canon drawn back to you. Or when you ask ChatGPT to write you a poem, it rhymes in English. So we're not co-creating with everyone, just a particular worldview. The magic we could do is in interrupted through this tool which hides human workers, moderators, and presents us back something from scratch, but it was stolen, right? So we certainly have seen a way in which AI has been used to track people, suggesting continued bias in police enforcement and sentencing is continuing to implement bias in hiring or lending or in other financial systems, right? So that's our present. But to look towards our future, I think we need to look at the creation and the myth we wrap in it. So for this new AI age, we need to think of a collective creation myth, a myth that does not cast AI as the aristocrats making art and writing poetry, deciding our political destinies, while we humans are left to toil in unsafe working conditions, and nine to five jobs that cannot keep us out of poverty. I work with AI because I do believe it's a tool that can help us understand, simulate, and interrogate climate data in a way that can help us to adjust to our climate crisis. I believe data and science storytelling need to move outside the walls of academia and newsrooms and into every area of expression so that we can hear climate stories unfiltered from those who are experiencing the climate crisis most acutely. We don't know yet what the creation story of AI is, but I hope in these thoughts I've laid out today, we can begin to orient the conversations we do have about this technology in a way that's strategic, truthful, and appreciates the real stakes of the stories that we tell. So thank you so much. I, I now have a brief timer. I'm gonna drink water and I'm gonna play a video for you. Sounds good, <laughs> all right. Um, so I've been talking for a lot, but thank you. Um, and this is a video that the National Endowment for the Arts made. Um, I, got I got into coding because I wanted to do wanted things to that do I couldn't do by myself. Do by myself. And, and being able to collaborate, being with, able to collaborate machines with machines meant that I could do things that I, could do things that I do, that I do poorly, poorly, faster, faster, and then I could do things that do machines things do that poorly, machines uh, do poorly uh, better. Uh, better. <laughs> The first place the I started performing I started was with my mom, who was, was a storyteller story from the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Confederacy. I would play I would the play Iroquois the rattle Iroquois and drum rattle while she and told stories. She told story. I then became I a then classically became trained, trained opera singer. Trained opera singer. I, started I started composing and directing and, and making and more and more emerging technology, emerging technology mixed, mixed with live performance and opera. And kind of ended up in museums. Nowadays, I use a lot of different media, AR and VR, interactive media, to tell stories, co-creating with other types of non-human systems. Non -human systems. As an, artist, as an artist, as an activist, as an activist I, look I look at the way that the Iroquois Confederacy, Confederacy was built. We said that we anything said that, that I'm doing now is the result of seven generations, generations behind, behind me. Anything, anything I do, anything will, have I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations, the seven generations, ahead, generations of me. ahead of me. We use stories, we use stories as a way of taking values, values and ethics and, ethics and, ethics and putting them and into putting the them core into of, innovation. of innovation. I started looking, I started at, looking the at the media landscape, landscape we have now. How do I take how information, I take and, information encode and encode it for future generations? Future generations? A, lot a lot of my work is really about creating an ethical about framework for software, software development and design, and, design. And, and articulation of values and ethics within technologies with the understanding that we need to future-proof these. There's a notion that the technology we've created now has outrun us. No one knows how to no regulate it. We accidentally opened this Pandora's box and we can't get it all back inside. But actually, but we can actually, choose to use technology to build a more just world, a more equitable world. We can demand that. We can say that we want algorithms that are human-centered, that are for our environment, that are pro-democracy. We can articulate the values we want to see in technology and communicate those to seven generations in the future. What do we, what want, do to we want to achieve with the culture, with the and, culture social and social network, network that we're network creating? That we're creating.
Um, I'm going to show you some images of some art now, because I talked a lot about science. I'm going to talk a little bit about art, art and ideas, right? <laughs> Maybe ideas and art. We, um, so this is a work of an immersive video installation that's currently in Amsterdam at the Next Museum. And it's two videos, one called Midnight and one called To Body. So this is how the video started. And then that's what it looks like installed in their 35-foot uh, square uh, immersive installation video space. So a little bit about this work. Who determines the protocols for looking at the sky? Like moss and fungi, animals and plants, and indeed most living beings, the sky does not have borders. It moves as part of a larger system that includes the moon, the sun, and the stars. This video work is part of Sky World, Cloud World, a more extensive series, and it continues to explore themes of a communication network throughout the skies. I was inspired to make this piece when I heard a politician lay claim to the quote-unquote universal ethical protocol for looking at the sky. It led me to think a lot about the various notions of owning the sky. They're like, who owns the sky? And the laws that treat airspace as territory or an extension of the land. The regulations governing what kind of frequencies we can emit across open air and the geographic information systems whose satellite we can see if the night air is clear enough. So this is also a poem that's embedded into the video that you can't see in there, there but so I'm just going to read it to you. Today I would like to cease being an artist, a person, a woman, a daughter, a sister. I would like to be midnight. I would like to be sky. To everyone who would rejoice, rejoin the sky and rejoice. The second poem is called To Body. A grandmother stood here, died here, left here, and now new let rest, a place which grew my mother, a place I return to. Dust blurs the dark and nothing looks the same. Not welcome, a bridge underwater. How soon our small faces are forgotten. I mean less now, and I'm still not small enough. Forget me like I forget to breathe, to bathe, to bed, to body, to boldly, to blend in. Why would you know me? I was never here. So in this series of projects, I'm examining the sacred nature of our cloud-based communications. I try to understand the cloud, you know, that, that data cloud up there? <laughs> But it's also like the clouds that are both a spiritual place and a vehicle for ephemeral ways that we communicate with our kin over distance and time. This concept of the cloud-based web applications has interrupted our notion of a sky world, of the cloud world, which is the grand connective tissue that all humans have with one another. We must maintain and honor our sky world, the layer of sky which protects our world, maintains our atmosphere, and which has given us the ability to communicate through invisible signals, through satellites, tubes, and more importantly, through dreams and imagination. And I'm required to say this because I'm very thankful that this project was made possible in part by generous support from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. I feel like I'm Sesame Street saying that, but I love Sesame Street too, so <laughs> thank you. Um, so this is another project called Seed Protocol. Um, and this is part of w the work that I do that's called science storytelling. And I'm interested in imagining how seeds would look even s you know, seven generations in the future. So for inspiration, I look at the diverse practices of seed keeping across North America. Every city and town in North America has seed keepers, right? And seed keeping groups, and the members are very diverse. Some seeds are even being grown on the moon. My collaborator and colleague and friend, Dr. Annalisa Paul at UF Space Plant Lab, is one of those people. And I learned more about Project Artemis and the botanical research that's happening on the moon. It led me to imagine what future seed keepers would look like, what seeds they would tend, and what type of protocols that would be created as indigenous people travel across the stars. Sometimes when I talk about space, people think that the studies on the moon are just about like extracting water from rocks or extracting resources. But our moon, soil of, of our moon and the soil of our Earth have about 60% similarity. And they're very connected. Our, you know how you see a lot of planets and the moons are very tiny in comparison to how big the planets are. 
um, even though there's tons of moons that are way bigger than our moon, right? But this, the size difference between the two of them, where we're so close in size comparatively in our solar system, that a lot of people think that they crashed into each other and then the moon became part of our orbit and from this collision um, as part of the, the way our solar system was born. More recent, some researchers have actually questioned this. And so they don't believe that we actually crashed into each other. They're just really, really attracted to one another. <laughs> so our, our moon and our Earth are so connected, not just the tides, you know, not, not just the things we know how much our moon uh, changes our planet, but understanding more deeply the soil and the way we can grow seeds on the moon is so important to understanding how we're going to adapt to climate change. So some people, not going to lie, are going to the moon for extractive reasons, right? But there are ways of understanding the moon that can help all of us here on the Earth without extracting, but by understanding. So I just want to say that because I think it's important and I really deeply respect the work that Dr. Annalisa Paul has done as the very first lunar botanical researcher. Right? It's pretty amazing. So, um, you know, I grew up, as I said, listening to my mother tell traditional stories, and we have a lot of stories about the stars and the moon. And so I always wonder how our values will transition to space and what diverse communities will want to establish protocol around seeds and seed, seed keeping in space for generations to come. And it's not just indigenous people who have sacred protocol around seed keeping. It's important for people in nearly every town I see or have lived in. So for this project, I created images of what seeds may look like in seven generations. Oops, I'm going the wrong direction. <laughs> here's maybe the cornfields that might, they might look like. Maybe. And here's the images of what seeds might look like seven generations in the future. And so I call this Seed Protocol Dynamical Lunar Indigenous Time, which stands for D-Light. And um, collectors in this ongoing project um, are helping me create seed keeping networks across the country. So by becoming a part of this project, collecting these seeds, they're also helping collect seeds in their local area and create a seed data bank from which um, you know, all of the followers of the project or anyone in the world can go and discover the, the local seed um, collective and keeping uh, communities um, across the world, anyone who's participating in the project. So I definitely recommend finding a seed keeping community near you, whether or not you want to be a part of this project. It's kind of amazing. There's even seed libraries here in New Haven. They're really amazing, right? So, you know, kind of go down a fun rabbit hole on uh, finding these. This is, um, if you just go to spaceplantlab.com, you can find out more about Dr. Annalisa Paul's work. And um, this is a project that was shown at the Whitney Museum of Art called Sunrise Sunset. And yeah, I'll read you a little bit about this project. And this is from the curator's uh, statement about it, because I have some fun animations. These are the animations that were part of the project. So Sky World, Death World combines animations and poetic text, connecting sunrise and sunset to indigenous creation myths. Sky World of Sunrise references the Haudenosaunee story of Sky Woman, who belonged to Sky People a tribe rooted in the celestial heavens before the world was created. And after falling through a hole created by an uprooted tree, Sky Woman creates a home on Earth out of the oceans and mud with the help of animals. Um, Winger Bears compares abstract animations of dawn created in a game engine with the question, who benefits from your burnout? Using it as a prompt for reflecting on the sharing of life, the death world of Sunset asks the question, what is made bright by the loss of your light, and hints at the thin veil between sleep and death while evoking renewal. The accompanying animation, actually this one right here, um, mixes visuals with a video clip of, of me um, that once was a part of my artwork, but it was totally lost. Like it was even collected by a major museum. They, they lost it, it was kind of like decayed. All the information disappeared to time. But I found this remnant on the internet archive um, so it's a testament both to the ephemerality of digital work and the potential for recovery. And the questions that um, are raised in Sky World and Death World were originally written for a series of billboards by the collective Four Freedoms. And this brings us to a VR piece. Oops, going back one. Never mind. No intro. You're getting the video straight. <laughs> It'll be exciting. <laughs> There is 
that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That really that's this really strange sponge that I bought. Shaved. That's the worst that's sponge really ever. Like it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it. We're like, this is this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. This is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. You know, Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was you know, just Sarah working was in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors. So I can say, like, I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped. Or it was so, like, loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your hands or feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. Interactive exploration. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs. And inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like, wow, this is such a strange feeling. It kind of reminds me of, for instance, like that time that I felt like my hands were feeling. I don't know. I feel like my hands were is a confusing machine. What we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't really exist but might apply in a situation that, like, maybe as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment, so I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen we experiences from at, you know a half like a egg carton half and how we would move from each at, you know, each space landing on the visuals for any project each, each is an interesting, process. interesting you know, process you know you have to make something that feels true to something that you like process. but it also has to be something true to what the other person like but it also has to be something true Sarah said she had this amazing friend Neve Bavarsky in LA who was a illustrator we reached out to Neve and you know showed him all of the reference imagery showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for and we were like, can you do the knee version of and we were like, your hands are feet universe. And then from there, um, we were like, how are we going to put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense like for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not like depressing or scary, but just a little bit scary maybe. It's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent. So we were like, let's Try, this tool, medium, so we like, um, try this tool medium which is a 3d vr sculpting tool and so we felt like um, oh this is perfect that we found this, so this way to like, find like oh, a slice of what we were interested in a way that we could produce it in a really organic and fun way and that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're having organic and fun way that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're a lot of our music is going to be generative a lot of our music is going to be generative. so generative music is when you're really designing those so wise therefores and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end, and there's like you know, nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive the song, the there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. You're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. Me and Sarah are doing like all this work to create a really fun Me playground. We might have kind of serious really concepts about the emotional we resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about, like even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, about, like, that action has to be connected. So we want 
each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might have had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, they just oh, it it's like an experience it, where your hands like, are feet because oh, don't you ever just like feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like, like, like something you've never felt before? Well, isn't it, VR the perfect way like to kind of explore well, that? And people are like, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? That makes perfect sense. So that's been pretty surprising. So uh, many of you came to the workshop today of talk to me about water and you talk to me about water members you want to raise your hand up and pick on you guys they're right there in the back I'm going to show you images of them in a second so talk to me about water is a uh, creative climate justice initiative that facilitates conversations around the importance of water through cross discipline collaboration and education our climate lounges you know have been on uh, for the last year and we have a performance of one of our climate lounges this Friday on Governor's Island at 4 p.m. Um, we even have a haptic space that you can sit on and experience the vibration of the waves. We have lights and videos that are created with um, water data from the USGS. We'll be, have some original songs that we're singing, and we're even using some AI as well. So if you'd like to come and see that, it's free and open to the public. You can get on the ferry and hang out with us. And that's part of the Rivers to Rivers Festival um, for the Lower Manhattan Cultural Center, and that's at that art center on Governor's Island. So, um, uh, William Gibson famously said that the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. Right? We kind of heard that about technology. But what is also true is about our global water crisis, because it's here, but currently the most heavily affected are the global indigenous who work hard to protect the ecosystem. So part of Talk To Me About Water is to bridge that gap and hear unfiltered st stories and voices who are experiencing the water crisis more acutely than others. The global indigenous people are the most water poor in the world, suffering the most from water theft, contamination, pollution, and a scarcity of potable water. So ignoring their water stories is ignoring a very, very valuable and important message from the future. 80% of biodiversity on our planet is on land stewarded by the global indigenous, even though we make up less than 6% of the global population. So we're an interdisciplinary group of scientists, coders, machine learning specialists, artists, musicians, performers, art and ideas, right? And we present our water stories and experiences at workshops like we did today. And we do it at public festivals, museums, universities, open source summits. Just try to be at the most public and free and available places we can find, right? And really wonderful places like Art and Ideas. So thank you so much for having us. Um, so that's how we find new audiences that we can hopefully bring this information to that sometimes they get left out of these scientific conversations. Our, our youth and our children, our elders, like everyone needs to be part of these water conversations. And our, our, one of our members made this great diagram where we have you know, our storytellers, our coders, our creatives, we have our water scientists and our researchers. We're really central there. We're centering indigenous voices. Then we interpret and repurpose our water data and then we create these events to hopefully spark more conversations. That's why our name is Talk To Me About Water. We're hoping to just inspire more conversations about water. So I'm, I always like to close out my talks with some vulnerability by showing something that's in progress and not done. And I think that shows people that that's how these things work. They start messy and maybe they get better, maybe they don't. Maybe you'll never see this again because it'll scrap, I don't know. But that's how I like to end. I like to end in vulnerability. So you remember this one, which was Two Bodies in Amsterdam. So we're working on a new project and this one is called Two Bodies, like the TWO Bodies, working title. I don't know if that's gonna be the real one. And so it has me and my little sister who's right over there in the back. And in this project, we embody two future ancestors who return to this world to remember their ancestors and the water stories of this planet. 
after traveling the stars for seven generations. We imagine a future of descendants who understand how valuable water is. So this story becomes a vivid one with the two sisters finding each other here, the lowest point on Earth in what is known as the womb of the Earth. And we were invited here by our other member of Talk To Me About Water, Noor Bataini, who is uh, a Bedouin and from the lands that are now currently known as Jordan. And she invited us to be her guest on an artist residency where we shot this. So, um, and this is of course images of the Wadi Rum Desert, which is one of the locations that we went. You know, we imagine that if we look at this desert, many, many years ago, this vast and beautiful desert used to be underwater. Today, Jordan's water crisis is such that in our lifetime, we may see the disappearance of both the River Jordan and the Dead Sea. So these are just production stills. The actual film was shot on 16 millimeter, and it's not even still in process. It's literally in my hotel room right now. So I'm <laughs> on my back, back from here, I'm dropping it to Kodak. So let's hope it develops. So these are not the film stills. These were just the iPhone behind the scenes, um, very much in production. and. Um, that's it. Nyawe Eskoge. Happy to take questions, getting a little bit of water, untangling myself from some of these twos. Hi, yes. Hi, how are you? I have a question. It's not a biased question. So do you remember two years back when Facebook made the two AIs and they created the language that they spoke together and nobody knew what was going on or what they were saying? So do you believe possibly that that's why some people are a little like spectacle and nervous about AI coming into play? Because as you stated, they are way smarter than we are. So you think maybe the scientists who create AI need to be a little bit more careful about the software that they involve in them? Absolutely, I think you put it really well. I have a lot of degrees. You're probably like, that's a smart question. No, no, that's a really great question, and and like, feel free to share even if you have more. Like, they they are. Yeah, I think some scientists are incredibly concerned. Some should really be more concerned than they are. Right? Some aren't concerned at all. Right? Only maybe about the green green concerns. Right? Um, and as you mentioned, sometimes these systems are communicating with each other in a way that isn't transparent to you and me. Sometimes it's not transparent to the scientists who built them. And those are scary things. We have to have trustworthiness in AI. We have to say, I know what's going to happen if I do X. That's what trust is, right? Trust is like, I come to shake your hand. I know you're not going to like hit me, right? That's trust. I say, I'm, and then I assume I can shake your hand. You're going to shake my hand back. And that's just normal. That's trust, right? So if I don't know what's going to come back, and I don't know how these systems are communicating with each other, we cannot trust them. If you don't trust something, why are you basing any decisions off of it, right? So if I'm saying, and we have, of course, that wonderful piece that ProPublica did about recidivism, right? And so judges say, you know what, it was fine, though. The AI didn't tell me how to sentence someone. OK. And I didn't have to listen to it. OK. But it sat there on my desk. And it would give me a number. So when someone came up and said, OK, this case is coming up, What's the number of percentage of this person committing a crime again, going back to prison? And it would just give you a number. And the judge said, I don't have to listen to that number. OK. But did it influence you? And the study proved that, yes, it did. And then they said to the judges, how do you know how it got to that number? I assumed it was like AI, right? It was smart and intelligent. And what if I told you here that, you know, because I <laughs> work with a lot of the research that, did, um, that the story came out with, and what if I were to tell you, and this is true, that one of the things that it told you with that number, one of the ways in which it decided if you were going to commit another crime was if you had a single mother. And if you did, you were going to commit a crime. And then they said that to the judges. Like, do you think if you have a single mother, you should go to jail more than if you don't have a single mother, you should go to jail? And the judge says, of course not. But they were looking at that number. <laughs> and they were making decisions that change people's lives, right? So how can we trust these things if we don't know what they're doing and we don't know the choices they're making by us and for us without us, right? So I think what you're saying is incredibly right. And I think all of us should have a say. The politicians, community organizers, activists, 
uh, you know, children, everyone who has a stake in the survival of this planet should have a say in these decisions that are being made and not offload that responsibility to something that's intelligent, right? Yeah, so thank you so much for that question. I think there's another question over here. Yeah, I have a related to question, two questions, uh, the second of which is related. First question is, I would like your definition of AI, because we keep using that term. Does it just mean really fast computers, or does it mean something else? And the second question is, what vision do you have of the ethical systems that could possibly be set up to contravene the bad effects that are possible, such as the one that you were talking about? I mean, the, the idea of setting up a universal system of some sort seems to me absolutely bonkers, <laughs> but also absolutely necessary. And I appreciate that. Um, you know, and, and I would say that the definitions of artificial intelligence since I've been in the field have changed, right? Um, and when I was on a plane recently on my way back home to Gainesville, I sat next to a really nice man, and he says, oh, if you're going to Gainesville, I bet you're a professor. I said, I am. He says, oh, what's your field? I said, AI. He says, that is so cool. I love UFOs. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's awesome. What do you mean by that? And he said, well, like artificial intelligences, right? Like not human. And I was like, oh, that is so much cooler than what I do. Um, but yeah, it's more like really fast computers. Like I think, you know, that's more similar than like, I wish, and I do believe that AI, especially this year, is starting to include non-human intelligences. And what does that mean? That's like fungi, that's trees, that's air systems, that's water systems, that's animal. Yes, it should include them, right? And that's happening now. But up, up until now, that has not been what people meant when they meant AI. They just meant a uh, field. It started out as like more philosophical and theoretical, right? And then it became like high-performance computing. And I work at a school that's funded by NVIDIA. They created high-performance GPUs, and it really created the boom that we have of AI right now. So we're kind of transitioning from this high-performance computing to what's next. I don't know what it's going to be. It's kind of an exciting moment that we're in. So I don't. I think the, I can tell you what people used to say, but I don't. I can't tell you what they're going to say tomorrow, which is okay. exciting, right? Fair enough. Okay. Yeah. And then the second, my second question. Yeah. So, you know, there are a lot of different groups that are organizing internationally as governing bodies that are thinking about these things. I go to a lot of conferences and I give a lot of talks, and I, I appreciate giving talks to to policymakers and leaders as well as the public. Right? Like I think it's important that we really bridge that gap so that pe the people who these lo these laws are going to affect understand this, so that they can kind of not be swayed against their own best interests. So there is organization internationally to create some type of regulation. Europe is leading right now. They have a lot of regulation. Um, and that by a lot, I mean more than zero, <laughs> but it's not very much, you know? We have zero right now. We don't have any in this country, but we're, we're trying to figure it out. And um, it's, we've seen that a lot of leaders in industry are those who are speaking you know, to our policymakers, but they have so much vested interest in, in the finances of it that it's, we really need something that can govern it you know, for and by us. And it's slow work and AI is moving so fast. And I think we've seen a lot in the media about people saying, should we pause then, right? Like if you can't regulate this before something really bad can happen, then maybe we, AI should slow down because it's moving so very fast. Um, and people who are maybe not advocating for a pause, but maybe I'm more in this camp that's advocating for trustworthiness. Like, don't use something until you can trust it. And trust means really doing no harm, right? And so I'm not necessarily about saying pause. I'm saying don't put AI where it doesn't belong until you can trust it. I don't think it should be part of our policing. I don't think it should be part of our sentencing. You know, I don't think it should be making decisions about who gets to live in what neighborhoods when their families built those neighborhoods. But how do we keep that from, right? my question, of course, is how do we keep that from happening? And I realize you yeah. may not have... Well, you know, I think it's it's a dual process. Like I often talk to developers and leaders of industry, and I tell them that it's their job. They get really mad at me, and they say, "No, it's the politicians' job." But when I talk to politicians, I say it's their job. So you know, it's both, right? Both of them have to work together because the people who are making these things understand the harm better than anyone else, and they have to like stand up 
and say, I'm not going to build these, these weapons of ma mass destruction, which is what they can be, right? And then also people need to be able to regulate them, but they have to work together. So I tell both groups it's both their responsibility, <laughs> you know? So. Oh, yes, right over here. Sorry, the light was right behind you. I couldn't see you. <clears throat> I don't know if you address this. I'm curious about what uh, people who are, are really aware of AI, what are they perceiving as uh, potential limits of where this can take us? And I, I'm thinking about statistical data and I'm thinking about um, how there's always uh, outliers and there's always anomalies so that when we get uh, some kind of information from AI, there should always be a, but there's like a point, point, uh, zero per, you know, point, point zero two percent that this is incorrect, and so you have to use that to, uh, to assess the information we're giving you. Absolutely. Where are we going with this? Yeah, no, I mean, you're absolutely right. Like, not only are there outliers, most AI right now is super backward propagating, right? It's looking backwards. And then it's making predictive decisions or generating things based on those backward looking um, data points. So we have so much data in the Western world and we have so much data in, that's written in English and we have so much data that like if you were just to look at who was given loans in certain areas to buy homes, that is incredibly destructive to communities that was made specifically to have racist outcomes, that was made specifically to marginalize people, that was made to disempower people. So if you say, tell me in the past who was given a loan, I'll give them a loan tomorrow, right? We know what the answer is gonna be. And so you could amplify bias, you could amplify abuse, you could amplify harm, but hiding it behind a curtain of, but it's a new technology, it's AI, it's not biased. It is bias because the data that it was fed created the model and that's bias, right? And you know, I mean, you know, I'm saying this, you know, because I, I like to speak in like plain English, even though I know you know what I'm talking about. And so I, sometimes I like to use the metaphor because people say, well, we'll just give it data that's unbiased. But we know that doesn't work with the models. Like it doesn't work. And I use this metaphor to say, okay, let's say you were feeding this apple tree contaminated water for 10 years. And then you realized it, oh shoot, it was contaminated water. I'm gonna start feeding it clean water now. Would you eat the apple from that tree? Like you shouldn't, if you know anything about <laughs> trees, like you shouldn't, because it was contaminated, right? Like you have to actually start building models now that have um, balanced data. And that doesn't mean just looking at the past so you can reproduce it, but worse, but it means looking at what possible futures you wanna build. That's a lot of data. I know, right? And it's, um, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Like I, had a, I met someone in Canada a couple days ago who said she was working on um, a, an algorithm that could help curators curate art so they could look from a collection of a museum and say like, I'd like to do a show about this and it would kind of like generate. And she said, what, what, could you imagine any like ethical problems with that? And I said, well, you know, if you look at the collections of most museums, they're from a specific group of people. And they, and they might have very small representation of other people that were collected in that museum. So you are gonna do a great job of reproducing all the shows that have ever been at that museum. But you're not gonna do a great job at doing things that might change the way people see art or change the way people see women artists or change the way people see artists of color, right? So, and, and she said, well, we could adjust for that. I'm like, then test it. Bring in those communities and try it out and have them use it and tell them and ask them if it seems trustworthy. Right? And I think that's a way of doing it, is saying, would you trust to use this? And they would look at it and say, no, it's missing these amazing people that, that did this and did that. And, right? and that's ways that you can bring the community and the users into your models right? from the beginning, rather than just feeding it the model and saying, well, this is it, tweak it later. Like, bring it in early and often, right? Just, just one other comment. I was just kind of curious about the... Uh the scientist, the black and white scientist who goes out and mm -hmm. sees red. I, I thought we learned to see colors, and I wondered if she would see red. If she went yeah. out and saw red, I mean, maybe she would see really it good at point. all. That's a really good point. And I think in the thought experiment, they imagine that, I guess, the mechanical aspect. I mean, I, I always wondered that, too, when I read this thought experiment. Because I said, I would like, like, for instance, my husband's colorblind. Right there. And um, one time I had dyed my hair pink. 
And someone at a party was like, oh, is your wife the one with the pink hair? He says, no, my wife's a blonde. Well, he's colorblind. He couldn't see that I had pink hair. He doesn't see it as pink, right? He can't see the color pink. So I think it is an odd thought experiment that they assume that people will understand what another color is, having never seen it. I don't think that, I think that's the, the physiological, psychological, sociological aspect of that experiment is, is faulty, I would say, yeah. But it's a thought experiment. Sometimes they just kind of use the aspects that, uh, <laughs> that, they, that are handy to them. It was mostly used in the theory of mind aspect of learning science. That's where this kind of thought experiment started. And at least the first work I did in AI that mentioned it was from a learning scientist kind of point of view. Of course, not socio-behavioral, psychological, you know, and, and optical. So like, I think that's why it has that hole in it. But that's just my guess. I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's a very simple question. Could you give me an update about what your collaborator in Brooklyn is doing now? Oh, Sarah? Sarah. Sarah, Sarah is a professor at NYU in the ITP program. And um, I, I think she's up for tenure this year. So I think, I don't know if they've made a decision yet, but I, let's, let's, ho let's hope that it was a good one. So yeah, she's doing really well, teaching another generation to do work like she does. Oh, last question. Ooh, that's heavy. Um, so I'm going to introduce a new topic, the Chinese. So the Chinese would be possibly, in your discussion, a group of people that would have a large database that's not Western canon, say art mm -hmm. and stories. Plus, we're sort of developing a real fear of the Chinese through all this TikTok discussion and what, how they might use artificial intelligence. So I'm, I'm not really trying to lead you into a discussion, but I'm just wondering when you hear, you, are you interacting with the Chinese? And when you think of China, what, how does China and I, AI interact in your mind? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say that we are, are very similar, right? Um, I think when, you're sp when I was specifically using the example of how an, an art generator will predominantly generate a Western sky, I have used uh, Chinese image generators that are accessible in the US, because not all of them are, um, that are accessible in the US. And I did see a similar bias. And it actually is because of the original models, like I mentioned in this um, comment, where the initial models, even that the Chinese were using, are, are a specific uh, group, an image bank that was coded in a specific way so that people test their models to see how accurate they are. So it's within that that it, this bias exists. I believe that the Chinese, I'm sure, are making different models, right? That are, that we all start with this one, and now everyone's making their own from scratch. But there's a minute, there's gonna be a couple years where we're all still biased in a specific way, but that's gonna diverge. India has incredible AI as well, right? So there are, and, and as I mentioned, most of the AI superpowers are the same as the world superpowers, right? The people who are doing the tremendous research um, that are focusing in AI is still um, the same as the world superpowers, right? So, it, and that is problematic because as something develops that could be a weapon or as something develops that could be a cure, if it's only in the hands of the few, it, that's dangerous for our whole planet, right? Oh, that's, I forgot that was the last question, so thank you so much. <laughs>